Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank God for the joy of our salvation. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We got something to have joy about, don't we? I was lost, but now I'm found. Hallelujah. I was going to hell, but now I'm not. I'm not going. You going to hell? No, I'm not going. I'm going to be with the Lord, going to be with him. And I get to walk with him down here by faith and have a good life and have victory after victory after victory, no matter what the devil tries to pull, and then get reward. Glory. They're working on our mansions up in glory. They're working on them. The Lord said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. How many believe you can trust Jesus? If, if he said it's that way, it's that way. You think you're going to like it when you get there? What are you going to say? What are you going to say when you see your place? When you see your place, what are you going to say? You're going to Jesus. That's just what I like. Oh, I didn't know I liked that, but oh, that, that is exactly, does he know you inside and out? Yes. Yes. Mm -mm -mm. Well, we're just here for a few more days. Should we do our duty while we're here? Should we we, the Bible said we are to endure hardness as a good soldier. We are to have a soldier mentality. We are here to do a tour of duty right now. And soon and very soon, we'll be out of here. But while we're here, we got a job to do, don't we? Should we find out where we're supposed to be stationed and what our equipment and job is? And should we be about the master's business. We should be. And so it's, uh, it's good that you just, you be in here and those of you joining with us by internet, it uh, tells me something that you, you know enough to know. You need to be here in the word of the Lord. You need to be in the presence of God's people and his spirit. And so here you are. Amen. Turn with me to two openings, if you would, to James 3 and Proverbs 18. James 3 and Proverbs 18, we've been on this subject for some weeks now, talking about the power of the tongue. The power of the tongue, and we should uh, continue. James 3, what is it, verse 2? James 3 and 2 said, Many things we offend all, if any man offend not in word, and what he says... The same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Perfect uh, in this context and from the words used doesn't mean flawless. It means complete. It means developed. And this is a, a, a sure indicator of where we are in our spiritual development and maturity. If you're constantly missing it, in what you're saying, you are not spiritual. You're carnal. You're a spiritual infant, undeveloped. If you're growing up, you'll go days and not miss it in what you say. Are y'all with me? If you grow and develop more, you'll go weeks and not, not say dumb, stupid stuff. If you're really growing up and becoming like the Lord, you'll go months at a time. You'll go a year at a time and not miss it in what you say. Somebody that's really growing up in the Lord and develop, then they, they don't miss it. They miss it less and less and less in what they say. Should we focus a lot on what we're saying and listen to what we're saying? 
He goes on in that chapter to talk about how that you can steer a horse with a, a, a bit and bridle. And you can steer a huge ship, even though it's out on the giant waves of the ocean and, and fierce winds blowing against the huge ship. You can control the direction of that big vessel with a relatively small rudder. I think if it had been writing today, he might have included the steering wheel. Because that's what these things do is steer the course of the horse, the ship. And he said, your tongue is like that bridle, it's like that rudder, it's like that steering wheel. Is it true what we're saying is steering our life? Yes. Is that true? Yes. That what's coming out of our mouth is steering us up, down, good, bad. Is it true that what we're saying is driving blessing away from us or it's bringing it to us? It's hurting us or it's healing us? It's hindering us or it's helping us? Is it true? If your life or some area of your life's been going in the wrong direction and you want to turn it around and get it going in another direction, just like your car, if you're headed south and you want to go north, what should you do? Not just press the accelerator harder and cry. And go, I don't want to go south, I want to go north, I want to go, oh, why am I going so far south, I want to go north. You got to, you, you got to, you can cry, you can beg, you can fast, but as long as you hold that wheel south, you're going south. And people are doing this, Christians are doing this, they're begging, they're praying, they're doing all this kind of stuff, they're counseling, but they won't change what they're saying. And so they're stuck going that same direction. In Proverbs 18 and 20, Proverbs 18 and 20 says, A man's belly shall be satisfied with what? The fruit of his mouth. And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Before increase appears in your accounts, in your wallet, in your purse, you got to get increase in your mouth. You must talk increase when you're not seeing any increase. Because that's how we turn this thing around, get it headed in the right direction. Don't ever say you're going under. Don't ever say you're having the worst year you ever had. The year ain't over. And what could an amazing couple of months do for your year? Watch what's coming out of your mouth. Don't talk like, well, we're down. You know, I've heard, uh, I don't know how many preachers and pastors refer to their down part of their year. Well, our crowds always fall off this time of the year, and, and this is our slow time. You, would, you couldn't beat me up and make me say that. I'm not going to confess that we have a slow time when people don't come. I actually believe these verses. The only thing that's happening in Faith Life Church is increase. That's all that's happening. I don't care what I see, what I hear, what I don't see, what I don't hear, who comes, who don't come, how much money comes, don't come. That is not what's directing my mouth. Come on, are you listening to me? We are increasing because the work of the Lord should increase. The people of God should increase. That's what's happening. Well, why should you say or do anything differently in your home, in your family, in your business? Say it out loud, we're increasing. We're increasing. This, is this is a good year. The blessing of the Lord is on us. Our things, Our things are coming up. We're advancing. We're, advancing. we're prospering. We're, prospering. We're, increasing. we're increasing. In every good thing. In every Prosperity, Prosperity is all around us, all around us. In, our in our life. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Talk increase. And see, it's most important for you to say that when it doesn't look like it. And it doesn't, that's what faith is all about. Anybody can say it when it looks like it and feels like it. It takes faith to say it when it doesn't look like it. When it looks like the opposite is true. 
but we're not moved by what we see, by what we feel. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. faith. And faith will even call those things that be not yes. as though they were. And that's how they become that way. Aren't you glad God didn't look at you and go, sinner, <laughs> sinner, lost cause? Because there certainly was a time when we looked like that, right? And we were that. But he saw us in Jesus. He saw us throughout the ages to come, ruling and reigning with him, being the glorified ones. And he said some things over us yes, he did. that's so wonderful. Yes, he did. And we can agree with him and say the same thing yes. and experience it yes. in our lives. Uh, verse 21, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Say that out loud, that first phrase. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Say it again. Death and and life are in the power of the tongue. Does it matter what we say? Yes. How much does it matter? It's a matter of death or life, what's coming out of our mouth. In uh, Hebrews, the third chapter, you don't necessarily have to turn there. They'll put it up on the screen for us. But Hebrews 3 and 14. I want, we, we touched on this in times past, but we need to revisit it. Uh, I'm, I told you wrong. 3.1, Hebrews 3.1 is the first one we should read. He said, Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. Now, a lot of your modern translations will say confession. Christ Jesus. Jesus is called the apostle and high priest of what? Our confession. Our confession. He's the high priest of what? Our confession. Our confession. Hebrews 4.14. 4, 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us do what? Hold fast, Hold fast our profession. Again, confession. Confession. And finally, Hebrews 10 23. 10 23. Let us do what? Hold fast the profession or confession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Jesus is the high priest, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Now, there are people that make fun of us and label us as extreme, in error, all kind of stuff. Call us that blab it, grab it, confess it, possess it bunch. But you know, it wasn't uh, Kenneth Hagin or Kenneth Copeland or Charles Capps or Jerry Savelle or or Roberts, or any of those who said, if you will say and not doubt what you say, but believe that what you say will come to pass, you will have what you say. Do you know who said that? Jesus, Jesus the head of the church. And so when these people are making fun of this, who are they making fun of? What are they making fun of? And there hasn't been enough emphasis. Do we believe Jesus is, the, is our high priest? But the Bible tells us specifically what he's high priest of. What is he high priest of? He's high priest of what's coming out of our mouth. Our confession. Now this is how we get born again. Isn't it? The, the most significant miracle in our lives is we believe in our heart and what else? We confess with our mouth. That's how you get born again. If that's how we get the greatest miracle in our life, why would we think things change with other areas? This is how God has always operated. The, the, the ground we stand on came into existence because God said. And we're created in His likeness and image. That's the way we're to learn to operate is believe in our heart and set with our mouth. This is the way Abraham 
uh, got his miracles and Moses and, and David. We've looked at some of these great examples. I mean, he uh, didn't it stir your heart to see David standing out there, a teenage boy facing that giant going, I am going to take off your head. I am going to do that. And he did exactly what he said. Yeah. Right? And we see case after case of that, and we should not let the enemy blind us to this or cause us to forget this or lay this aside. This is how we got born again. This is how we get healed. This is how we get our bills paid, how our babies get healed. Come on, are you listening to me? Everything works this way. And it's sad that most of the church is not talking faith. They're talking the problem. Most of the church is talking how bad it is, how hard it is, what I don't have, what I don't know, what I can't do, what's not working, what's not happening. And friend, that is just playing right into the hands of the enemy. That is letting him dupe us and lead us down the road to destruction. We are not that dumb. Come on, are we? We're not, we're not that dumb. We're going to make our tongues do their duty. We're going to quit talking what we feel and see and talk the word. Now, the, this word is translated in the King James profession, other translations, confession. The Greek literally means this. Vine's dictionary actually says this, that that word translated profession, confession, means to say or to speak the same thing. To speak the same thing. Say that out loud. To speak the same thing. Jesus is the apostle and high priest of what? Of us speaking the same thing. He is the apostle and high priest of you speaking the same thing. The same thing as what? That's a, that's a good guess. As what he said. The same thing that he has said. Now, there is a, uh, an area of ignorance, a lack of understanding in our circles, so-called word and faith people circles. I've heard faith teachers say this and preach hard about this. I've, I'm sure I've made mistakes myself along this same line. But people say, uh, you know, when it comes to confession, just decide what you want. And say it. And believe it. But that's not right. I said that's not right. You're not supposed to just decide anything off the top of your head. You're going to say and believe. And this has led to a whole host of problems. And this is how a lot of folk have had situations where they have said things. And it didn't happen. And they were adamant about it. And they said it and said it and said it and maybe said it for a long time and many times and it didn't happen. Now, of course, if you've heard from the Lord, just because something didn't happen in a few days doesn't mean you quit. That's right. That's right. And some things just take a while. But then other things, it's obvious it didn't happen. It's not a matter of just standing longer. It just didn't happen. And uh, some people get disillusioned in situations like that and they go, well, see there. That's not for everybody and doesn't always work and you just never know. But I want us to get into what can actually be going on in a situation like that. Lamentations 3 and 37. You don't have to turn there. They'll put it up on the screen for us. Lamentations 3.37 says, Who is he that says... And it comes to pass, when the Lord commands it not. You know the answer to that question? <laughs> Who is it? They're going to say something, and it's going to come to pass when the Lord said it's not. Uh-uh. No. If he said it's not, and you say it is, there's a clash of words. Boom. Do you want to be in that situation where you're actually speaking against something he said? Go with me to Numbers 14. Numbers 14. 
Numbers 13 and 14 tell the story of how God delivered his people from bondage in Egypt. And he told them he had picked out Canaan land, the promised land, a land that flowed with milk and honey. And they sent spies into the land, and sure enough, man, it was such a land of bounty. They brought back two men had to carry one of the huge clusters of grapes. And, but there were also giants. The Lord hadn't told them much about the giants. Giants and walled cities. And so even though Caleb and Joshua said, the Lord's with us, we can do this. Come on, let's go, let's take it. The majority said, no, we can't. They're too big. It's too hard. We can't. They will wipe us out. No way, no how. So the majority of the people believe that. We're talking about a lot of people, hundreds of thousands of people. The Bible said they all went back to their tents and they cried all night long. And they said, wish we'd have died in the desert. And this angered the Lord. We've already studied this. And he finally told him, you said that too many times to me. We're going to die in the wilderness. And you, what's going to happen is what came out of your mouth. Yeah. And so he said, so all right, don't go in. Go back into the desert. And you're going to want to wander out. You're going to wander out there for 40 years, one day for one year for every day uh, of the spying out of the land that you didn't believe me, didn't accept my report. But I'm going to take your kids in there anyway. Well, when they heard that, that made them sad too. <laughs> and Numbers 14, you know, let's just stop right here. Does it matter what you say? Yes. Whew. Is their life being affected yes. by what they've been saying? Yes. And Numbers 14, and uh, 40, well, let's see, back up to 38, verse 38. 39, Moses told these sayings to all the children of Israel that they're going to have to go into the desert now. They're not going to get to go into the promised land. And the people mourned greatly. And verse 40, they rose up early in the morning and got them up to the top of the mountain and they said, Lo, we're here and we will go up to the place which the Lord had promised, for we have sinned. Now that sounds like a good confession. We're here. And the Lord told us he wanted us to go. And we're going. We're going. Is there a problem with this? Yes, there is. Why? He has told them something else now. Right? right? right. Now, do you remember that the Lord called these folks stiff-necked? The Lord called, he said, you're a stubborn bunch. Why? Because if he said go, what'd they say? No. no. So he says, don't go. So what'd they say? No. We're going. <laughs> now this reveals a contrary nature. But this contrariness can be disguised with a bold faith confession. Sometimes when people are making their bold confessions, we're going to go do this, and we're going to do that, and we're going to do this, it's actually a cover for their rebellion. Are you listening? Because the Lord has told them something else. But they're going to use their faith and do what they want. This is rebellion, isn't it? And who has said, and it's going to come to pass, when the Lord has said something else? Come on. Proverbs says, there is no counsel, there is no wisdom against the Lord. Amen. Nothing works against Him. Nothing. Nothing. You don't want to be against Him. You want to be with Him. And what is Jesus the apostle and high priest, pre, high priest of? And what does that word mean? He is the apostle and high priest of us what? Same. Not saying something different. The same saying the same thing. Saying the same thing. So, verse 42, Moses told him, he said, 
Don't go up. Go not up. The Lord's not among you. That you be not smitten before your enemies. So what they say? We're going. Making their faith confessions. We're going. We're going and taking the land. The Lord said, you better get in the desert. No, we're going. We're here. We're ready now. <laughs> See, it's a cut. The Lord said, this has been going on for months. He'd tell them, uh, go out and gather the manna. And, and don't save it. So what'd they do? They'd save it. He'd say, don't go out to get the manna. So what'd they do? They'd go out to get it. Ornery. Stubborn. Contrary. If he said sit down, they'd stand up. If he said go, they'd say no. He said, all right, stay. They go, no, we're going to go now. You're right. You're right. Have you ever encountered this same spirit anywhere in your dealings? <laughs> Woo. You know what this is? This is part of the nature of the devil. That's him. He is the original stand up in God's face and say no. That's where it started. With him. And you need to despise it. You need to absolutely despise this rebellious contrary contradicting spirit. Don't let it have any place in you. They presumed to go up the hill. Verse 44, they did what? They presumed to go up the hill. Verse 45, the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites and discomfited them. What does that discomfited mean? I mean, they kicked them all the way back down the hill. <laughs> and didn't stop there. They kicked them all the way to Horma. When you've been kicked to Horma, that's bad, man. You've been <laughs> kicked all the way to Horma. <laughs> That's past your house. <laughs> Deuteronomy 142. Okay, now let, let's, let's stop. Were they making a good confession? We're going up. We're taking the land. That sounds good. But it's rebellion. Because the Lord told you something different. Yeah. Deuteronomy 142. Moses described. He's telling them what happened. From inspired utterance. He said the Lord said to me. Say to them go not up. Don't fight. I'm not among you. Now when the Lord says don't go. Because I'm not going with you. <laughs> Is it time for you to say. I will go. I will take it. I will receive it. I will. It's time for you to sit down. Sit down and shut up. Right? It ain't time to make bold declarations and confessions. <laughs> she said, so I spoke to you and you would not hear it, but you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord and you went presumptuously up the hill and the Amorites that dwelt in the mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do and destroyed you in the sea air even unto Horma. Presu you did it presumptuously. I saw an interesting definition of this last night in my study. Presumptuous means among other things Proud, arrogant, insolent. But listen to this definition. Unwarranted boldness. Now that really tells us something, doesn't it? Were they bold to go up and take the land? Were they making bold statements of confession about they're going to take it? But it was unwarranted boldness because the Lord told them something different. See, this will answer so many questions. We, we, we got folks in our circles that they learned about faith and confession and they've been making confessions and saying and doing some things, but have had some things that didn't work. 
and it didn't turn out right. And some people in their ignorance, they get angry at God and go, well, Lord, I said that, I said that, I said that. Why didn't it come to pass? Yeah, but what did he tell you to say? What did he, he tell you to say? See, just because something is generally the will of God doesn't mean he told you to say that now. It was the will of God for them to go into the promised land, wasn't it? It was the will of God for them to possess the land that flowed with milk and honey. That was the will of God, no question about it. And you would think, well, they're just saying the will of God. Yeah, but because of their rebellion and disobedience, he's now told them something else. And you can't ignore what he told you. The Spirit of God said something to you. He brought one verse to you. You can't take another verse and confess that and ignore what the Lord just told you. Can you see this, friends? I know uh, one of the first times I began to learn this, I was working in Brother Hagin's ministry, and we had counselors on the phone, and I was one of them, and people called in for prayer and help, and this lady called in one day just sobbing, weeping. I couldn't tell what she was saying, and she's from up northeast, and, and finally I, she, I understood that she said that she had just gotten mugged that morning. In a large city, some yahoo came, knocked her in the head, and grabbed her purse and took off with it. And, and, and I'm searching my heart how to comfort her, how to try to help her. But, but she began to say that wasn't a, her losing her purse and her money and stuff. I asked her, is she okay? And she said, yeah, she's got a bruise and this and that, but she's, she's okay. But the thing she couldn't understand is how this could happen to her. Because she's a believer. And she confessed virtually every morning. The things from the 91st Psalm. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. No evil will befall me. Nothing will touch me. How could this happen, she said. Well, let's, let's analyze that. Who's she irritated at? She don't even know me. Who, who's she annoyed at? She's annoyed at God. The, even though it's not spoken, it's not said, the implication is, God, where were you? Why didn't you intervene? Why did you, how come you let this happen to me? I'm a believer. And she just said it and started crying and sobbing again. She said, how, how come this to happen? And she quoted the 91st Psalm to me about how many times she had said it. And I didn't know. I'm sitting there on the phone thinking, Lord, how can I help this lady? And I'm just searching my heart. Lord, what can I say? I don't know. Why? And a couple of questions began to come up in me to ask her, and she calmed down a little bit. I said, well, what were you doing that, uh, this morning and last night? T tell me something, anything that led up to this. And, and um, she got quiet. And she said, well, I said, what, wh did you need to be there? What were you doing? What was going on? She got real quiet. She said, well, actually, I had a check about going. I said, you had a check? She said, yeah, I had a, a, a check about don't go down there. Don't go that part of town today. She said, but I just begin to quote the 91st Psalm. I begin to say, I dwell in the secret place of the most. Well, she, she was talking about the Lord didn't protect her. He was trying to protect her. Come on, can you see that? He was telling her, don't go. And what if she hadn't gone? She would have never known about any of this because it wouldn't have happened and the question would have never come up. And I begin to see it. People are adamant about making a confession and all the while are ignoring the leading of the Spirit. That does not work because the, Lord, the leading of the Spirit is the Lord too. Same one that wrote this book is in you. And if he's leading you and directing you something, you can't quote something he said to him. Instead, the Spirit of God is telling you, don't go downtown. And you say, well, I'm going to quote something to you that you said, Holy Spirit. You said, I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Holy Ghost said, yeah, I know I was there when I said that. And I'm telling you, don't go downtown. You say, yeah, I know that, but. No evil shall befall me. And Holy Ghost says, yes, I know. I said it. But I'm also telling you, don't go downtown. 
today. <laughs> Can you see this, friends? So here they are going, we're going to go take the land. We're going to go take. There was a time they should have been saying, we're going to go take the land. But now some things have changed and the Lord's told them something else. And their confession, as good as it sounds, is blatant rebellion. Uh, unwarranted boldness. Go with me to uh, Isaiah, the 14th chapter. Isaiah 14. When words contradict God's words, when they collide with His, what happens? Are there any words more powerful than His? No. We can check some with somebody that has close personal experience about this. The devil. <laughs> the devil was not created the devil. He's, an, he's a fallen angel. There was a time when he was in the presence of the Almighty. Experienced the holiness of God. And saw the glory and, and, and the operation of God and the things that he was doing. And of course God has always operated by believing and saying. And the devil saw this. And in his distortion, he decides he's going to use this against God. God who created believing and saying. He's going to take believing and saying and use it against God who created believing and saying. That just sounds dumb, don't it? And you sit right here in Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14 and what is it? Uh, 12. He said, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Verse 13, for you have said in your heart. What did the devil say? Listen to what the devil said and what he tried to do. He said, come on, put, put yourself, there was a day back long ago that an angel decided he's going to say something in faith, contrary to God, his creator. He said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. What's he trying to do? What's he trying to do? Oh, he's, he's trying to believe in his heart and say with his mouth and have what he says. Because he knows this is how it works. He's watched God do it. We don't know how long. He knows God gets it inside him. God says it and it happens. It is. Nobody tempted him to do this. He came up with this on his own. He decides he's going to say it and he's going to rise up He's already in the presence of God. How come he didn't have enough sense to go, I'm blessed. That's right. That's right. Thank you. I am going to get to stay in the presence of Jehovah. I'm going to sing my song. I'm going to do my thing. No, that wasn't enough for him. He got to looking thinking, I will ascend from where I am. I will go up higher than anybody's ever. I'll go over above all the stars. I will be like the most high. And God decided he had to say something about that. Come on. Next verse. 
He said, you will be brought down to hell and to the sides of the pit. Can you see a war of words? The devil is spouting these words out and God says, you ain't going up. You're going down. And when those words clashed, there's no struggle. How many know there ain't no chance of the devil ever ascending above and being just like the, um, ain't never going to happen. But these words that God said, you're going to hell. That's it. He's on his way right now. It's just a matter of time till all these things transpire. Would you agree that you never want to be in that position? That you're saying things that are actually contrary to what he has said. You do not want to be, put yourself in that position. Go with me to the book of John, please. John 14. <clears throat> there is no better example of faith and confession than Jesus, our Lord. How many think he is the best example of having faith and making a confession that you could ever follow? How did he do it? How did Jesus make confessions? How did he order his speech and the way he spoke? John 14 John 14, 10, he said, Believe this thou not that I'm in the Father and, and the Father in me. The words that I speak to you, I speak not of myself. Did he speak his own words? Did he just say anything he decided to say or anything that crossed his mind? Can you see he was very disciplined about what he said? He said, I don't speak of myself. Say it out loud, I speak not of myself. Not of myself. That means f from his self as a source. What he's saying didn't come from him, he said. But the Father that dwells in me, that's where I'm getting what I'm saying. So in that case, what is he saying? What is his confession? The same thing. Come on, can you see that? He's saying the same thing the Father said. Amen. Look with me at the 12th chapter, back up to 12, John 12 and 49. Jesus said it like this, I have not spoken of myself or from myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment about what? What, what, what commandment did the Father give him? About what I should say. And what I should speak. He's not saying his own words. He's not just saying what he thinks he wants. Or what crosses his mind. Or what other people is saying. Can you see? He is very disciplined. About what he's saying. Why are people of God saying, 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 saying. And it's not happening. Because they spoke too quickly. They started saying too quickly. What do you mean? The Bible says be quick to hear and what? Slow to speak. What does that mean? You may think you know what to say, but don't just go by what you think. Don't trust in your own understanding. Trust the Lord in your heart. And even though you might have said a different thing, the same thing two or three times and it worked, Every day is a new day. And the Lord knows things you don't know. And his word is true and you should speak according to the word. But it's a big book. Which verse are you going to speak according to? And you don't just pick something at random and wind up saying something contrary to what he said. For you for now. There's case after case where things have come up. And the first thing we ought to do is start checking our heart going, Lord, what do you say? What do you say over this? That's what I should say. And you may not know the next 30 minutes. You may not know the next 30 days. Did you hear me, friends? 
But if you'll wait on him and look to him, he'll bring to you remembrance something from the word. He'll say something to you by the spirit. And when he does, you won't have to ask. It's quickening. It quickens you. And you just know this is it. This is it. This is it. Now, when you start saying that, and you say that in faith, now you're not just saying something, you're saying the same thing that he has said over it, and nobody's bigger than him, and he does back his word, and it'll come to pass. It'll come to pass. Jesus said, I've not spoken of myself, verse 49, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say. And what I should speak. See, people have endeavored to operate intellectually instead of spiritually. If anybody ever comes out with a thousand volume set on what to say in every situation, don't buy it. <laughs> don't get it. Because <laughs> if you could have got by with a thousand or a ten thousand volume set, you wouldn't have needed the Holy Spirit. There's only one way to know. Don't just get, you know, it's, it's, it's okay to have some confession lists and some things, but don't get locked into lists and stuff and technical wrote responses and say, well, I got this, so what verses are on this area? No, there's a specific thing from the Lord. And the only way you know that, we, 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 we're not just living legalistic lives. The living Spirit of God Amen. is in us. We're supposed to have a relationship with Him. We're supposed to commune with Him. We're supposed to have a prayer life. Are you listening? Amen. And if we are, then we, we can hear from Him about specific individual things. Not talking about hearing voices or seeing visions, but the Bible said the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit and he will cause us to know. We're not to say just anything. We're to say what he said. Jesus said, he went on to say, verse 50, I know his commandment is life everlasting. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And when we're saying what the Lord told us, commanded us to say, there'll be life in that one. Because we're not just saying words we came up with, we're saying His words. Hallelujah. And His words in our mouth is life Amen. in our situation. He said, whatsoever I speak therefore, even as the Father said to me, so I speak. I think situations like where they caught the woman, you know, in the act of adultery, and they came, threw her down in front of Jesus, said, the law says, stoner, what do you say? You know what he said immediately? Nothing. That's right. Did you notice that? He knelt down and started writing. Why didn't he just say something? It's not like he didn't know some word. <laughs> right? Not like he didn't know some scriptures. How many think Jesus could have thought of several scriptures to say? And we have to watch about that because just because you know some scriptures don't mean you start rattling some stuff off. When people ask you, you should listen and be quick to listen and slow to speak and, and, and checking in your heart. Okay, Lord, now what, what is the word for this? What word would you have us to say? What have you already said over this? What are we to say and look for that? Can you see sometimes people are endeavoring to believe for something and say something and the reason it's such a struggle is because the Lord's trying to lead them in another direction. He would have had them saying something else and doing something else. Well, yeah, but this is good and it's, it's great. and it's Yeah, but that don't mean it's the will of God for you. Well, God wants me to prosper and have good things. He does. Well, God wants me to be healed. He does. But you know, he told Naaman, go dip in the river. Yeah. Right? He didn't like that word. <laughs> he wanted laying on the hands. Didn't he? Yeah. It made him mad, made him fighting mad. He thought, surely I thought, he said, 
the man of God would come out and strike his hand over the place. And he's leaving, mad, in a huff. Well, is laying on the hands right? It is. Is prayer right? It is. But when the Lord says dip, when the Lord says dip, forget the prayer line. Get the prayer line off of your mind. When the Lord says dip, I don't care who they are, how lovely they are, and how much you wanted them to lay hands on you, forget about their hands. Forget about it. And go dip. Go dip. Can you see how people get in trouble? Because they say, well, I know Scripture, and the Scripture said call for the elders of the church, and they pray over them, and it sure did. But the Scripture also said dip. Also said prayer of agreement. Anointing with all. Hmm? Pray for the sick. They'll be healed. I mean, there's a lot of different things in there that wind up at the same healing. Which one are you supposed to be saying? There's only one way to find out, and that's from him for you. And the thing you ought to be saying is the same thing he's saying. Come on, can you see this? The same thing he's saying. Mm, thank you, Lord. Can you see how some people have been confused? So, well, I did that. I did the laying on of hands. I did the anointing with oil. Yeah, but he told Naaman to go dip. So they're going back to the house. He's mad. Come all this way. That preacher didn't even come see me. He sent his helper out to me. Said the man of God said, go, go dip in the river. What does he think I stink? He think I smell? I don't need a bath. We got better rivers in my, my home country than that muddy thing. He's mad. He's upset. Because he knows about laying on the hands. Laying on the hands is right. He's got scripture for it. And prayer. And so I mean, that's what you're going to do for me. That's rebellion. That's stuff. You're going to get in the man of God's face and tell him what he's got to do for you and how he's got to do for you. You're getting in God's face. You ain't God. You ain't the boss. You ain't in charge. Don't tell him. Ask him. Ask him. Don't tell him. I'm leaving for this. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. What you need to do is ask. Ask. Put your nose in the carpet. Humble yourself. Ask the Lord. Say, Lord, I know healing's your will. I know prosperity is your will. Forgive me for saying and running off half cock and doing a bunch of stuff. I'm getting quiet. I'm sitting here still. I'm asking you, please, you tell me. What am I to say? And old friend, if you'll do that, you'll begin to hear things that you hadn't got clear on before. It'll begin, and, and, and in just a few months, some things you'll look back and go, oh, no wonder. Oh, man. God, you are so merciful. Oh, I don't even like looking at that. Because you'd be just like them. You're hard. I'm going up the hill. I'm going up the hill. <laughs> Presumptuous, unwarranted boldness. Are you with me, friends? But when you've heard from him, that's when it's time to get bold. Come on now. When you've heard from him, now you can get bold. Now you do declare it. Now you do set yourself and never quit. And it shall come to pass. Can you say glory to God? Everybody stand up. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let me lead you in a prayer. Say it out loud, Father God. Forgive us for being presumptuous, saying things, being adamant when you didn't tell us to say it, unwarranted boldness. Forgive us. We repent. We humble ourselves in front of you. We ask you not tell you, not tell you 
We're asking you what you're saying over our specific situation because we choose to say what you say in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Oh, just lift your hands. Praise Him for a moment. Lord, we worship you. You're right. You are always right. Your way is perfect. You've never missed it. You've never failed us. You've never let us down. It's never happened and it never will. We worship you. We worship you. Any failure, any shortcoming is on our end, on our part. We acknowledge it. We own it. But you are gracious and good to forgive and so merciful. So merciful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I see some things as we're here waiting before the Lord. Just keep your eyes closed. There's some folks who have been saying some wrong things and just kind of banging your head against the wall. But if you will make this adjustment that's going on right now, I see some things turning around for you quickly, quickly. The mercy of the Lord in your life. I, I see you changing what you're saying and getting in line with Him and saying the same thing with Him. And I mean in days, in days, some of these situations that have been going on for years, turning around, turning around, because now you're in agreement with Him. Somebody say, so be it, so be it. So be it. Be it unto me, Lord, according to Thy Word. Thank you, Lord. Thank Yield you, Lord. To the Holy Spirit. Yield yourself. Oh, thank to you, the Lord. Unction of God. Thank you, Lord. Yield yourself. To the Holy Spirit. Let him be your God. Sing it again. Yield yourself Whoa. to the Holy Spirit. I yield myself. Yes, I do. To the unction of God. I yield myself. I yield myself. Yes, I do. To the Holy Spirit. I will let. I yield myself, I yield myself to the Holy Spirit. I yield myself to the unction of God. Yes, I do. I yield myself, I yield myself to the Holy Just close your eyes. Wait on him just a moment. What are you saying, Lord? What are you saying about that situation? We choose not to be hard-headed, not to be stubborn, not to be contrary, obstinate. But yield it, yield it. Yield it unto you. Said out loud, Lord, I say what you say. About everything. I say. Not what I think. Not what I want. Not what others say. I say. What you say. I say. What you say. About everything. Oh hallelujah. Oh. Sing it again. I yield myself. I yield myself to the Holy Spirit. I yield myself, myself to the unction of God. Oh, I yield myself, yield myself to the Holy
Lord. You know, this is some of the most valuable thing you'll ever learn in your whole life. And it's some of the most important stuff that I've ever learned is to be led. And as we go through each and everything that we do, let's watch to not be so quick to just answer somebody when they ask us something or do something. And it is the hardest thing that you can do if you talk as much as I have in the past. I'm not going to confess it for my future. But watch. Don't be so quick to give your opinion to people. Don't be so quick to answer. Don't be so quick to say something. Because your direction, so much people looking at you, can help somebody go down a wrong path. And they need to be hearing from God for themselves. It's time that people grow up for themselves. Because we can't hear from God for other people. And a lot of times they already know the answer. And we're helping lead them in the wrong direction. So uh, let's let them, it's easier to look to somebody else to make your decisions for you. But it's so much better if you look to the Lord for your very own self and hear from God for your very own self. So uh, let's do it. Commit to hear from God for yourself and find out the answer and do what he says. Glory to God. Altar care workers, if you would, come down here. If you're in here today... And the most important thing that God's telling you right now is that you don't know him. That's the most valuable and precious thing that you can have. Because you don't want to be the one that's like the devil and going to hell now. You want to be the one that's going to heaven where the greatest things are. And the streets are paved with gold. And the glory is there. And the most precious thing is there is God. So if you're in here today and you don't know him, if you would, after the, we are dismissed, come down here to the front. These people want to pray with you. They want to get you filled with the Spirit. They want to lead you in the right direction where you can make all the right choices and the right decisions. Glory to God. And then as you go, help lead people to make the right decisions, but don't make their decisions for them. Show them how to make the right decisions. Give them the right direction to do it. Glory to God. And let's hear from God on the decisions that we have to make, and we will always make the right ones. Glory to God. All right, you're dismissed, and we love you. And they'll sing, and we'll go. Have a great week. Be blessed. To the Holy Spirit, I yield myself. To the unction of God, I yield myself. Yeah. Uh -huh.